On the night of October 12, 1984, 20-year-old Angela Samoda eagerly picked up her telephone and dialed her boyfriend's number. But after he picked up and they spoke for just a few minutes, Angela's smile on her face faded quickly, and while she didn't exactly slam the phone receiver back onto its cradle, she did put it down with more force than she needed to. Angela actually really liked her boyfriend, and even now, after 10 months of dating, her heart beat faster whenever she thought of him. Handsome Ben McCall, already a few years out of college and already a construction project supervisor. But still, Angela couldn't help feeling really disappointed that he had just said no to her invitation to go out with her that night. Angela knew Ben had to be at work very early the next morning, but it wasn't exactly a common occurrence for her to ask him to do things like this. Because most Friday nights, and Saturday and Sunday nights, Angela was cooped up in her off-campus condo studying. Angela was a third-year student at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, and she was enrolled as a double major in the school's highly competitive electrical engineering and computer science programs. Her goal was to use her degree to break into the heavily male-dominated world of engineering. And to ensure her dream became a reality, she had decided early on in her collegiate career to always put academics ahead of her social life. However, this did not mean Angela lacked a social life or that she was an antisocial person. Quite the opposite, in fact. Even though she lived off campus, Angela was the social chairperson of her college sorority. A sorority is a women's organization on a college campus whose purpose is to create a sense of community and friendship. And she was known among her big circle of friends not only for her intelligence and academic achievements, but also for her cheerful attitude and great sense of humor. Within her sorority, Angela was also known for always taking the time to regularly check in with her sorority sisters, chatting, asking how things were going, whether there was anything she could do to help people out. Angela was also strikingly beautiful. She was about five feet, four inches tall with a slender build. She had dark blonde, thick hair, blue eyes, a radiant smile, and she always looked fit and athletic. Angela was actually so attractive that not long ago, it had created a very uncomfortable situation for her. One of her admirers, a fellow college student, had begun just shamelessly following her around campus and leaving notes on her car windshield saying that he wanted to be part of her life. But in truth, that situation had actually worried Angela's sorority sisters much more than it worried Angela, because Angela just had a lot of faith in her own ability to take care of herself. Now, as Angela stood in her kitchen and wrapped her fingers on the counter next to the telephone, she suddenly decided she would just give her boyfriend one more call. Maybe she could change his mind about going out that night. After all, this was not just any Friday night. This was the day before one of the biggest sporting events in Texas. It was the annual rivalry game between the University of Texas and the University of Oklahoma. And it was being played right there in Dallas at the world-famous Cotton Bowl Stadium at the world-famous Texas State Fair. That night in Dallas, thousands of people, college students, alumni, residents, and tourists, would be out in force enjoying the State Fair, packing the local bars and nightclubs and restaurants, and gearing up for the next day's big game. But as Angela went to reach for the phone to call Ben back, she stopped herself and sighed. She knew Ben was not about to change his mind. During their call, Angela had told him that her friend, Anita Kadala was going to be going out with them that night, meaning Ben knew he could turn down Angela's offer and Angela would not be left stranded for the night. She would have Anita to still go out with. Also on their call, Angela had even pulled out the big guns and tried to make Ben a little jealous to see if maybe that would convince him to go. She had told him that if he was going to stay in, then maybe she would just give Russell a call to see if he wanted to tag along with her and Anita for the night. Russell was really just a friend, but he was a male friend. However, Ben had not been phased and had just said, okay, sounds good, have fun. After sitting there for a moment, feeling totally annoyed and dejected, Angela suddenly sat up and thought, you know what, I will call Russell and see if he wants to go. So she went to her bedroom desk and rummaged around for the notebook where she kept her phone numbers. Once she found it, she turned to the B's page, and there it was, Russell Buchanan. Russell, who was 23 years old, had graduated a year earlier from Texas A&M's School of Architecture, 
but Angela hoped that he still liked going to college parties and sporting events. Angela had met Russell during his senior year at a happy hour one night with a group of mutual friends. Russell had immediately been attracted to Angela and had asked for her phone number. They exchanged information, and a few days later, Russell had called Angela and invited her out to lunch. Angela had said yes, but later wound up canceling on Russell, and so they never actually went out on a date. With her phone book in hand, Angela walked back to her kitchen, picked up the telephone, and dialed Russell's number. Even if he wound up not wanting to go, at least this way, Angela could apologize for canceling on him on that one date. But when Russell picked up, he was all in on the idea of going out with Angela and Anita and so he agreed to meet the girls later that evening. Not long after speaking to Russell, Anita arrived at Angela's condo, and after doing a little bit of studying and taking a quick nap, the girls began getting ready for the night. Before she and Anita left the condo, Angela took one last look at herself in the mirror. She was wearing one of her favorite outfits. It was a black silk jumpsuit with an open back and a pair of black high heels. She knew she looked her very best, but once again, she found herself wishing that it was Ben she was going out with. Turning away from her reflection, Angela picked up her black purse, she grabbed her car keys, and then she and Anita left the second floor corner condo at 4944 Amesbury Drive. They headed down to the parking lot and hopped into Angela's Toyota Supra car. Angela was not a big drinker and had volunteered to drive them around that night. Angela turned on the car, she put it in drive, and then the two women drove the short distance to Russell's nearby apartment. After Russell climbed in the car around 9.30 p.m., the trio headed 10 miles south to their first stop of the evening, Bennigan's, a local bar known for its steak and ale. But Bennigan's was just a warm-up. By 11.30 p.m., Angela, Anita, and Russell had made their way first to the Boardwalk Beach Club, a singles bar that was popular for its 1950s and 60s style music, and then on to a nightclub in downtown Dallas called Nostromos. Shortly after they arrived there, Angela, who now missed her boyfriend even more than she had before she left, decided she would just give him another call and see if maybe now he would want to join them. But after being awakened from his sleep, Ben was not any more inclined to come out and meet Angela. However, since Ben was a member of the club where they were at, Nostromos, he called the front desk and got Angela and her friends access to their exclusive Rio room, which was the back room of the club. Angela still wished she could just have Ben, but the Rio room was a pretty good consolation prize. And so Angela spent the next hour or so dancing inside of this VIP area with Russell and Anita, and then when she wasn't dancing, she was walking from table to table saying hello to all the folks who were in there. According to Anita, it seemed like Angela knew literally everyone at the club that night. By 12.30 a.m., Angela was feeling tired, so she flagged down Anita and Russell and signaled that she wanted to leave. Angela had plans to get up early the next day and actually leave Dallas before the big crowds descended on the Cotton Bowl Stadium. She wasn't going to stick around for the big Texas versus Oklahoma game. Instead, she and some of her sorority sisters had decided to drive 100 miles south to Waco, Texas, to watch the football game between their own school, Southern Methodist University, and Baylor University. When Angela, Anita, and Russell left Nostromos and stepped back out onto the street, the crowd outside, and really all around Dallas, was just as thick and rowdy as it had been earlier in the evening. The three friends made their way through the crowd to Angela's car that was parked in the outdoor lot across the street, and then about 15 minutes later, Angela pulled up in front of Russell's apartment. Before he went inside, he walked around and gave Angela a long hug, and then when Angela climbed back inside of the car with Anita, Anita looked at her and just rolled her eyes. Anita had had a great time that evening, but more than once when Russell was dancing with Angela in the Rio room, Anita had definitely felt like she was just a third wheel. Angela just laughed it off and said Russell was a friend, and then they pulled away from the curb and kept on driving. By 1.15 a.m., Angela had arrived outside of Anita's dorm room. Angela had asked Anita to stay with her at her condo, but Anita had politely declined. The women hugged and said they'd talk tomorrow. Then Anita went inside of her building, and Angela hopped back inside of her car and then pulled away from the curb and began driving back home. But as Angela drove, she made a sudden decision to swing by Ben's apartment, which happened to be right on the way. Maybe if she just appeared on his doorstep, he might invite her to stay. But that did not happen. 
When Ben finally opened his front door, looking totally groggy and disheveled, he was not pleased to see Angela standing there. After a brief chat, he told her that as nice as it was to see her, he really just needed to sleep, so could she please just head home and they could talk tomorrow. Angela would eventually accept defeat and would turn around and head back down the steps towards the street below. After Ben watched his girlfriend climb back into her car and drive off, he turned around and went back inside and climbed back into his bed. But just 15 minutes later at about 1.45 a.m., right as Ben was finally dozing off again, he heard his phone ring. Groaning, he rolled over and picked up the receiver, already knowing that it had to be Angela, and it was. But this time, something was very different. She was not playfully trying to convince him to come see her. Instead, her voice sounded strained. Something was wrong. She was calling from inside of her condo, and her first words to Ben were both strange and distracted. Ben, Angela said, talk to me. And when Ben heard a sudden noise in the background and the sound of a voice calling out a question, Ben's anxiety flared. Angie, he said, are you okay? Angela hesitated for a second, and then, still speaking in that sort of distracted and disjointed voice, she said, I let a man into my condo. Before Ben could respond to this, he heard the sound of utensils clattering on the kitchen counter very close to the telephone, and Angela suddenly telling him in a rushed voice that she would call him back in just a few minutes before she suddenly hung up the receiver without even saying goodbye. By now, Ben was wide awake, and when a few minutes went by and Angela did not call him back, Ben dialed her number and got no answer. As he jumped out of bed and started pulling on his clothes, he called a second time, and again there was no answer. Now Ben felt a flash of panic, and still pulling on his jacket, he ran outside and he jumped into his truck. Although portable cell phones wouldn't be a thing until the 1990s, as a construction supervisor, Ben's truck was equipped with a satellite phone. And as he made the 8 to 10 minute drive to Angela's condo, Ben used that satellite phone to call Angela's number again and again, but still there was no answer. Once Ben pulled into the parking lot of Angela's condo building, Ben saw Angela's car in its usual space. He parked his truck not far from her vehicle, and then he leapt out of his truck and ran to the stairs to Angela's front door, where he began to press her doorbell while also banging on the door and calling out her name. When no one answered or came to the door, Ben turned and ran back down the stairs and around the building to another flight of stairs that led up to Angela's balcony and where her back door was. When he got up to that door, he began banging on it and calling out Angela's name again. But again, there was no answer. Ben would eventually leave the back door and run back to his truck out front, where he would use his satellite phone to call 911. At 2.17 a.m., the emergency dispatcher who received Ben's 911 call sent a couple of officers out to do a welfare check at 4944 Amesbury Drive. The dispatcher told the police officers that a young man named Ben McCall was worried something bad had happened to his girlfriend, Angela Samoda, who lived at that address. When the two police officers arrived at the scene 23 minutes later, they found Ben sitting quietly on the back steps leading up to Angela's condo. To that point, the two responding officers had spent that whole night and the early morning hours answering lots of complaints of noise and drunkenness and disturbance as all of Dallas seemed to be out on the streets partying. And so, tired and at the end of their shift, they were confident that this call would be no more serious than all the others they had been to so far. After directing Ben to go get the master key from the on-site building manager, the police officers walked around to the front of the property to knock on the door and to double check that the condo really was locked. It was locked, and after they knocked, no one answered, but a few minutes later, Ben arrived with the master key. With Ben waiting outside on the sidewalk, the police officers used the master key to open Angela's front door, and then they stepped inside. And almost immediately, the officers knew that this call was not like the others they'd responded to that night. On the carpeted floor of the living room just ahead of them, they could see there was a single black high-heeled shoe tipped over on its side, and near it was what looked like the track of another spike heel that had been dragged through the soft pile of the rug, like someone was still wearing that second high heel when they were dragged across the living room. 
After seeing this, both officers reflexively put their shooting hands down on their gun holsters. One of them, a rookie officer named Janice Crowther, who had just joined the Dallas police force one year earlier, immediately felt the hairs on the back of her neck stand up when she saw those two shoes. Turning around and looking out the front door, motioning Ben to stay where he was, Janice turned back and stepped into the living room for a closer look, while her partner turned left and headed for what looked like a bedroom door. A minute later, as Janice was looking around the living room and not really seeing anything, she heard her partner calling out, I think I found her. In the 31 years that Officer Crowther would go on to serve in the Dallas police force, she would never see a crime scene any more brutal than the one that met her eyes when she stepped into Angela's bedroom. Inside, Angela Samoda was lying on her back. While the upper part of her body was still on the mattress, her long, tanned legs dangled off the edge of the bed, not quite touching the floor. Her naked body was covered in blood, and it was clear right away that she had been the victim of an incredibly violent attack. The officers immediately rushed over to her and checked for a pulse, but Angela was deceased. After making sure the attacker was no longer in the condo, police radioed for an ambulance, crime technicians, and a team of homicide detectives. Within minutes, the street outside of Angela's condo, as well as her building's inside parking lot, became the scene of police cars and flashing lights as officers quickly cordoned off Angela's unit with yellow crime scene tape. 30 minutes later, lead detective Virgil Sparks and his partner Russell Graves were standing in Angela's bedroom looking at the ruined remains of a young woman who just hours before had had a vibrant life and a promising future. Their first impression was that this murder had been a crime of intense passion. In violent cases like this, where there was no sign of robbery, police knew from their experience that the motives were often rage, jealousy, love, revenge, or some combination of those. Detectives would need to wait for confirmation from the crime scene techs and the results of Angela's autopsy, but it certainly looked to them like Angela had been the victim of a violent sexual assault. And since there was no sign of forced entry, it also looked like Angela herself had opened the door to her attacker. From the defensive wounds on Angela's hands and arms, and the single high-heeled shoe that was still lying in the middle of the living room, detectives also surmised that there must have been a struggle, and that Angela had likely tried to fight off her attacker. And from the smears of blood on the bedroom light switch, and the bloody residue around the drain in the bathtub, and on the bottom of the shower curtain, it also appeared that after killing Angela, her attacker had used her bathroom to try to clean themselves off before leaving the condo and taking the murder weapon with them. Feeling sure that the killer had to be someone who knew Angela, the first people that the police wanted to talk to were the men in Angela's life, starting with Ben. If it was true that Angela had called Ben at 1.45 a.m., when, according to Ben, she sounded distracted and in trouble, which had prompted him to go check on her at her condo, and given that Ben called 911 at 2.17 a.m., then the murder had to have occurred during those intervening 32 minutes. If the killer wasn't Ben, then that meant Ben had just magically arrived at the condo within minutes of the killer making their getaway. It just seemed too convenient for Ben. So the detectives believed Ben had to be involved, or at least know something about what happened. His proximity to the crime and connection to the victim was just impossible to ignore. 30 minutes later, Ben was sitting across from the detectives in the interrogation room at the Dallas police station. And the thing detectives noticed about Ben right away was his very unemotional response to what had just happened to his girlfriend. Ben just kind of sat there quietly as if nothing had happened. So when Ben again brought up the phone conversation he'd had with Angela at 1.45 a.m. when she sounded scared and she said that she let a man into her condo, the investigators were just not necessarily buying it. They felt like maybe Ben was making this call up. So the detectives focused their follow-up questions not so much on this call at 1.45 a.m., but on whether Ben had been jealous that Angela had gone out that night with Russell and not him and whether maybe Ben was just angry because maybe he suspected that Angela had other men she was seeing romantically besides him. But Ben swore he had nothing to do with the murder. 
and even though he would refuse to take a lie detector test, he would agree to get blood and saliva samples, as well as scrapings from underneath his fingernails. He also agreed to let officers search his truck and condo and access his phone records. By later that same morning, police had three more names of possible suspects. Angela's sorority sisters had told them about a former boyfriend named Lance Johnson from Angela's hometown of Amarillo, Texas, who had once threatened Angela with a knife and who still called Angela wanting to get back together. The police also had the name of Joseph Patrick Barlow, the Southern Methodist University student who had been known to follow Angela around campus and leave notes on her car windshield along with writing love poems to her. And then there was Russell, the young architect who had spent the evening with Angela and Anita and who had asked Angela out on at least one date and had been stood up by her at least one time. But that afternoon on October 13th, as police were getting ready to follow up with each of these men, they received a critical piece of new information that would change everything. The preliminary results from Angela's autopsy had come back, and she had indeed been sexually assaulted and her attacker had left behind plenty of bodily fluids, including semen, which meant her attacker was a male. But a test of those bodily fluids showed something unique. It would turn out the man who attacked Angela was what's known as a non-secretor. A non-secretor is an individual, man or woman, whose blood type antigens do not show up in bodily fluid other than blood. In other words, their saliva or semen or other fluid secretions do not contain any markers of their blood type. Approximately 50 to 80% of all people are secretors, while 20 to 50% are non-secretors. And so this information immediately allowed police to start ruling suspects out. Today, police use DNA testing to track bodily fluids back to an exact individual. But back in 1984, when Angela was murdered, this kind of rough sorting of suspects using information like whether they were a secretor or not was about as good as police were going to get. So with the non-secretor news coupled with bulletproof alibis, the list of suspects suddenly dropped from four names down to just one. Not only was Angela's potentially violent and jealous former boyfriend Lance a secretor rather than a non-secretor, he was also asleep in his parents' house in Amarillo, Texas, on the night of Angela's murder. And although the student who had followed Angela around campus would turn out to fit the bill as a non-secretor, he too had a rock-solid alibi that ruled him out. That left two suspects, Angela's boyfriend Ben and Russell Buchanan. And while Ben had seemed very much like the number one suspect, the search of his truck and apartment had turned up nothing, and phone records placed him far enough from the scene at the suspected time of Angela's death that police doubted he had the time to commit the murder. He also was eventually proven to be a secretor. Russell, on the other hand, was a non-secretor, and he had been with Angela right before she was killed, and his apartment was only a five-minute walk from her condo. But what really snagged the police's interest in Russell was the fact that when investigators went to his apartment to interview him on October 13th, just hours after Angela's body had been discovered, Russell was nowhere to be found. In fact, it wasn't until Monday, October 15th, more than 48 hours after Angela's murder, that police finally found Russell at his home. And when Russell answered their knock on his door, he found a shotgun pointed directly at his chest. It wasn't exactly a raid, but it was clear to Russell that he was in some serious trouble. With the shotgun still aimed at his chest, detectives ordered Russell to go with them to the police station to answer questions about the murder of Angela Samoda. Once they were in the interrogation room, Russell told the detectives that he had nothing to do with Angela's murder. He said he didn't even know she had been killed until the police were at his door that morning with a shotgun pointed at him. He said the last time he saw Angela was when she and her friend Anita had dropped him off at 1 a.m. after the three of them had left the club. He told police that he was never involved romantically with Angela and that he knew she had a boyfriend and he was not jealous. When asked why he wasn't around on the 13th and 14th, Russell said he'd been at a wedding in Dallas before flying to Houston, Texas to visit his parents. 
and he had only just gotten back late on the 14th. Russell's story seemed plausible, but he didn't really have an alibi, and he was a non-secretor, so investigators could not rule him out as a suspect. However, without any other hard evidence that actually linked Russell to the crime scene or to Angela's death, Detective Sparks and Graves had to let Russell go. Over the next few weeks, six investigators, who were all assigned full-time to Angela's case, chased down every lead they possibly could. They interviewed everyone, from friends and family, to the mechanics who worked on Angela's car, to the workers who had installed the carpeting in Angela's condo. But no one had any useful information. Crime Stoppers, a community program that encourages people to provide anonymous tips about crimes, featured Angela's case in a televised program and even offered a reward of $1,000 for any useful information. Also, Angela's own family offered a reward of $10,000 for information that would lead to her killer. But still, nothing came in. And as every lead seemed to go cold, Detective Virgil Sparks couldn't help but keep coming back to one name on his suspect list, Russell Buchanan. Russell had not been ruled out yet, and in Detective Sparks' eyes, Russell just seemed like the guy. And soon, one of Angela's friends, Sheila Gibbons, would become Detective Sparks' unlikely ally in his effort to uncover incriminating evidence against Russell. 22-year-old Sheila Gibbons was especially traumatized by Angela's death. Not only were the women both members of the same sorority, but also Sheila had been Angela's roommate during Angela's first year at Southern Methodist University. When they first met, it had seemed like the two girls did not have much in common. Sheila struggled with dyslexia, a learning disability that made it hard for her to correctly interpret words. And so while Sheila struggled with her studies and preferred socializing to books, Angela was the opposite. But over time, these differences actually seemed to draw the girls closer together. Sheila made sure that Angela didn't just study, and Angela helped Sheila focus on schoolwork. Even after Angela had moved into her own condo off campus, the women had remained very close. And just one week before Angela's murder, the two of them had had one of their regular get-togethers to catch up and chat about what was going on in their lives. On the weekend that Angela was killed, Sheila had been away from the university visiting her mother in North Texas, and that was where she was when she got a call from one of her sorority sisters who broke the terrible news. Sheila was completely devastated, and as soon as she got back to the campus, she went straight to the Dallas police station to see if there was anything she could do or tell them that would help in their investigation into Angela's death. And it was there at the station that Sheila happened to look over and see some of the crime scene photos of Angela right after she had been raped and murdered. And it was a sight Sheila could just never forget. After speaking with Detective Sparks and getting the impression that he was especially suspicious of Russell, Sheila offered to arrange and record conversations between herself and Russell in hopes that Russell might tell her something incriminating. And on top of Sheila spying on Russell, police also set up 24-hour-a-day surveillance on Russell, and they also pulled him in for questioning on dozens of occasions, picking him up at his work or at his apartment or anywhere in between. But all of that came to a screeching halt in April of 1984, when Russell hired a well-known defense attorney who told police they had to either charge Russell with a crime or leave him alone. And because at that point, police still had not unearthed any hard evidence against Russell, they were forced to just leave him alone. And so Russell became yet another dead end. And by the late spring of 1985, the Angela Samoda murder investigation had basically gone ice cold. And around the same time that investigators set Angela's files aside and changed the status of her case from active to suspended pending new information, Angela's friend and Detective Sparks' unofficial spy, Sheila, really started to struggle. Angela's unsolved killing had shattered Sheila's sense of safety and security, along with her belief in the justice system. Convinced that Russell had just gotten away with murder, and still feeling totally traumatized by the brutality of her friend's murder, Sheila would drop out of Southern Methodist University in the middle of her senior year. 
For a while, after she left school, Sheila just sort of drifted through her life, overwhelmed by the sense of numbness that Angela's murder had caused. Eventually, in 1986, Sheila would meet a man named Charles Wasaki, they would get married, they would buy a house together, and they would have kids together. And for the most part, Sheila was able to just kind of focus on her family and move on with her life and not let Angela's murder dominate every aspect of it. But all of that would change one evening in 2004. By then, Sheila was 43 years old and was living comfortably with her family in Nashville, Tennessee. And while she did still periodically think about her friend Angela, the thought of what happened to her was still so traumatic that often whenever Sheila thought of Angela, she tried to bury those feelings and not talk about them. But one night that year, as Sheila was sitting up in her bed alone, trying to complete some homework for a Bible study class, she happened to look up from her Bible, and what she saw at the foot of her bed shocked her. Standing there was her dead friend, Angela Samoda. According to Sheila, Angela looked exactly as Sheila remembered her. From the clear blue eyes to the huge smile that used to light up the room, her friend was dressed in the same brown sweater and matching brown skirt that she had been wearing the last time she and Sheila had gotten together at Southern Methodist University to catch up on each other's lives. Even though Angela would vanish just a moment later, Sheila described that experience of seeing Angela standing there as a, quote, God nod. A message, not from Angela, but directly from God, that it was time for Sheila to get out there and make sure Angela's murder case finally got solved. As Sheila lay there in bed, stunned by what had just happened, she thought back over all the advances in DNA testing that had been made over the last 20 years and how every day it seemed like more criminals were being identified through the genetic traces they left behind, from their fingerprints to a stray hair or a drop of blood or saliva or semen. And so as she sat there, her sense of shock quickly gave way to a clear sense of purpose. She put her Bible down next to her, and then she reached over to the table and she grabbed the phone off the nightstand. A moment later, she was talking to an officer at the Dallas Police Department, asking to speak with the detective in charge of investigating Angela Samoda's murder. And even though that call didn't net her any new information about the murder, that didn't stop Sheila from pursuing this God-given mission to solve her friend's murder. Over the next 12 months, Sheila would call the Dallas police station 781 times to request they do DNA testing in her friend's case to try to figure out who her killer was. But each time, the request was denied because the case was still cold, there were no new leads, and at this point, they didn't even think they had the original crime scene evidence anymore to test. And even if they did, DNA testing was very expensive, and for a case this old, it didn't seem worth it. Finally, after those 781 calls didn't work, Sheila decided to just get a private investigator's license. This way, she would have the professional credentials that would force the police to take her and her requests for DNA testing seriously. And in 2006, two years after Sheila had seen the vision of Angela in her bedroom, she finally started seeing real progress on Angela's case. That year, the Dallas police finally established a cold case department, and largely because of Sheila's rabid insistence over the years that they look into Angela's case, the first case this new department pulled for re-examination was Angela's. That year, working directly with Sheila, the detective handling Angela's case was able to track down the original physical evidence that had been collected at the crime scene, and they sent it off for DNA testing. Once the DNA analysis was finally completed, the results were entered into the Federal Bureau of Investigation's database of known and suspected criminals, but there was not an immediate match. However, investigators would continue to search that database, and finally, two years later in 2008, Sheila got a call from the Dallas police saying they had found a match, meaning they had finally discovered who killed Angela. And when they told Sheila who the killer was, she could not believe it. Based on the DNA analysis, along with other pieces of evidence and testimony, here is a reconstruction of what really happened to Angela Simona. 
Back on the night of October 12, 1984, when Angela and her friends Anita and Russell were going from restaurant to restaurant and bar to bar having a good time, it didn't take long before Angela was drawing lots of admiring glances from men who were also at all of these establishments they were going to, especially when she and her friends stepped out onto the dance floor. Unlike a lot of the people who were out celebrating that night, Angela was drinking very little alcohol. As a result, her smile was genuine, her eyes were clear, and her movements were graceful and coordinated. The man who was sitting at one of the bars that night could hardly take his eyes off of this beautiful young woman in the black jumpsuit. And when Angela accidentally brushed up against him on her way to a table in the corner of that bar, this man felt a sudden thrill at the silky touch and warm scent of Angela's bare skin. It was then that he decided to follow her. He told himself that he just wanted to watch her, enjoy how good she looked, maybe just see where she lived and whether the boy she was with was also her boyfriend. So when Angela and Anita and Russell left the Nostromos Club at about 12.30 a.m., this man was waiting for them. He was standing just outside the exit of the club, maybe a few feet off to the side, so as not to be too conspicuous. Although this man was over six feet tall and weighed nearly 260 pounds, so he was enormous, and so trying to remain anonymous had always been a big challenge for him. But luckily, that night, the street was so crowded with drunk people that he hoped this beautiful girl and her two friends would not notice him. And when Angela and her friends emerged from the club, they didn't. They just walked right past him without a second look. The big man waited a few seconds to let them walk a little bit farther into the crowd, and then he put his hands in his pockets, he put his head down, and he began secretly walking behind the three friends. The trio would push past the big crowd out into the street, they would cross over to the other side, and they would make their way to the parking lot where they climbed into Angela's Toyota Supra. By the time Angela had turned her car on and began backing out of her parking spot, the big man who had followed them was now sitting only a few spots away in his idling vehicle. As Angela put her car into gear and began driving out of the parking lot, the big man put his car into drive and then eased his foot off the brake and slowly hit the gas. It wasn't long before the big man felt another thrill. At the first stop Angie made, that was the name he'd overheard her friends call her, the young man who had been with them got out. He hugged Angie and then made his way into the nearby condo building. Meaning, even if that young man was Angie's boyfriend, he wasn't going to be spending the night with her. A few minutes later, the big man could hardly contain his excitement when Angie stopped again, this time at a college dormitory where she said goodbye to her other friend, the girl. Angie was now all alone. But the big man's smile faded when Angie's third stop took her to an apartment where she knocked on the front door. This couldn't be her own place or she would have just used a key and walked in. A minute later, an outside light switched on and the big man saw another young man open the door and a moment later, Angie had stepped inside and the door had shut behind them. So that was it, the big man thought, at least for tonight. That young man who had just opened the door must be Angie's real boyfriend and she is going to spend the night with him. The big man suddenly realized how tightly he was gripping the steering wheel and he took a few minutes to force himself to just breathe and relax. But even as he was getting ready to turn his car back on and drive home, the door to this apartment opened again and he saw Angie step back outside, her blonde hair shining like a halo in the porch light. Watching intently from his car, the big man held his breath, then let out a sigh of relief when the young man inside the apartment stepped back inside and closed the door. Angie was alone again. Breathing a little faster now, the big man in the car watched as Angie walked back to her Toyota. She unlocked the door, slipped once more behind the steering wheel, turned on the engine, and pulled back out onto the road. She never noticed the car that pulled out behind her and followed her the rest of the way home. Ten minutes later, Angie was climbing the steps to her condo on Amesbury Drive. The big man had parked his car on the other side of the street and made a mental note of which unit was hers. He had made up his mind. He was going to go inside. But it was important that he got to her right now before she was settled in her bed. So, after taking a deep breath, the big man looked around him to make sure no one was watching. Then he climbed out of his car, he shut the door quietly, and began walking across the street toward Angela's building. 
Once she was inside of her condo, Angela put down her purse and hung up her car keys. But just as Angela was about to slip out of her black high heels and head for the bathroom, she heard a sudden but quiet knock on the door just a few feet away from where she was standing. Then she heard a man's voice and more knocking, still quiet but insistent. Whoever was out there sounded apologetic and kind of embarrassed, and so Angela stepped closer to the door and just listened. The man outside began talking again. He said he just needed to find out where the nearest payphone was. He'd just take a second or two of her time. Please, could you just open up the door? Reassured by the tone of his voice, Angela reached out and she unlocked the door. But then, before she could even turn the door handle, the man outside had pushed the door open himself and was now stepping into her condo. Forced backward, Angela felt a sudden rush of fear. The man in front of her was enormous, and he had these small, flat, green eyes and a thin mouth. And as soon as he was inside of her condo, he just started repeating his question about the payphone while also simultaneously turning around, shutting her door behind them, and locking both of them inside of her condo. Then, with the door locked, he turned back around and faced her and began slowly walking toward her while asking if he could use her bathroom. For just a second, Angela squeezed her eyes shut, trying to gather her thoughts and find a way to make him leave her condo. And then she thought of Ben. What she needed to do was call Ben. This huge man would never hurt her if he knew that she'd told her boyfriend that he was here in the condo with her. So, as Angela forced herself to open her eyes and face the big man who was bearing down on her, she also reached out for the phone on the kitchen counter and quickly punched in Ben's number. The man didn't try to stop her from using the phone. He just continued walking closer and closer to her while asking, where's your bathroom, where's your bathroom? With the phone up to her ear, Angela quickly gestured to the intruder with her other hand toward a tiny hallway on the other side of the living room where the bathroom was located. As the big man suddenly turned away from her and began striding toward that hallway, Ben answered Angela's call. Right away, Angela began speaking, doing her best to stay calm, but her voice sounded strange and disjointed. Ben, she said, talk to me, please. And in the seconds that followed, Angela kind of awkwardly explained that she had just allowed a man into her apartment and he's using the bathroom, and he's asking about a payphone, and did Ben know if there was a payphone near her condo? Maybe if the intruder knew where the payphone was, he'd just leave. But before Angela could explain anything else, the big man emerged from that hallway near the bathroom and strode right back over to Angela and again began asking her over and over again, where's your bathroom, where's your bathroom? The big man was now so close to Angela that the only way to put distance between her and him was to hang up the phone and back up. And so Angela quickly told Ben she'd call him back in a few minutes, and then she dropped the receiver onto its cradle. But before Angela could step away, the big man had taken one of the knives out of her butcher block on the kitchen counter, and even as Angela tried to turn and run toward the front door to escape, the big man lunged and he grabbed her with one arm around the waist and began pulling her away from the door. Angela did her best to fight back, but her attacker was way bigger and stronger than she was, and so a moment later she was being forcibly dragged across her living room towards her bedroom. After throwing her onto her bed, the big man climbed on top of her and then pressed down hard with his left hand over her mouth and face to stifle her screams. Then he violently raped her. After he was done, with his hands still pressed down over her mouth, he straddled her torso with one knee on either side of her, making sure she couldn't move. Then, with his free right hand, he reached over and he grabbed the knife he had taken from the kitchen that was sitting on the bedside table. Then, while staring straight down at Angela's wide eyes, the man raised the knife in his right hand over his head, and then he brought it straight down with all of his strength into the center of Angela's chest. Angela tried to buck him off, but seconds later he had pulled the knife out of her and then drove it back down again into a new spot in her chest. And he would do this over and over and over again, 18 total times. The force of these blows were so great that they broke Angela's breastbone. And even though the knife may have been as short as two inches long, it would go straight through Angela's heart and then come out of her back. And every time this huge man who was crouched over her like a monster raised the knife again to strike, a spray of blood left a thickening trail on the headboard and wall behind Angela and coated her face and body with droplets. 
except where the killer's left hand covered her mouth and where his enormous body covered her bruised and naked skin. Janice Crowther, one of the police officers who first discovered Angela's body early in the morning of October 13, 1984, would later testify at the killer's trial that when she first walked into Angela's bedroom, it looked like Angela's heart had been cut out and was laying on top of her chest. It would turn out Angela's killer was a 36-year-old convicted serial rapist named Donald Bess, who had targeted Angela simply because he liked the way it felt when she accidentally bumped into him at the bar. That was all it took. Angela didn't know him, and he didn't know her. Angela was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Donald was already an experienced predator when he first came in contact with Angela. He'd gotten out of prison on parole just six months earlier in March of 1984 after serving only six years of a 25-year-long sentence for rape, kidnapping, and aggravated assault. Although he was living and working in Houston, Donald had made the 240-mile drive north to Dallas several times that summer and fall to visit friends and to meet women at local bars. Nine months after getting away with the rape and murder of Angela Samoda, Donald would go on to rape, but not kill, yet another Texas woman. However, this time he was caught, and in 1985, he was sentenced to 999 years in prison, however, again with the possibility of parole. But in April of 2008, the DNA testing that Sheila had wanted the Dallas police force to do for so many years finally paid off, when the DNA at Angela's crime scene matched Donald Bess's DNA. On June 18, 2010, Donald Bess was convicted of capital murder in the rape and stabbing death of Angela Samoda, and he would be sentenced to death. Now 74 years old, Donald is still on death row at Polunsky Prison in Livingston, Texas. While there is no execution date as of now, Donald will never be eligible for parole. As for Sheila, when she finally heard the name of Angela's real killer back in 2008, she was shocked. For more than 20 years, she had completely believed that Angela's killer was Russell Buchanan. In February of 2012, Sheila met with Russell in Dallas to apologize for her attempt back in 1984 to connect him to Angela's murder, and her belief in the years that followed that he was the guilty party. Now a well-known and successful architect in Dallas, Russell was quick to forgive. In the end, Sheila's persistence had not only led to the discovery of Angela's real killer, but it had also finally lifted the cloud of suspicion Russell had been living under for more than two decades. Sheila is still a practicing private investigator. Her specialty is cracking cold cases. It was another beautiful day in late October, 1994. The afternoon air was cool, and the sky above the town of Voorhees was a soft, clear blue, dotted with fluffy white clouds. As 52-year-old Carol Newlander stepped out the door of Classic Cakes Bakery onto the sidewalk, she stopped for a minute and tilted her face upward to enjoy the feel of the light breeze and sunshine. With her eyes closed, she could forget for a few seconds that she was standing in a strip mall in northern New Jersey surrounded by parking lots and that pretty soon she'd be joining the hundreds of other drivers on the crowded highway that led south from Voorhees to Carol's home in neighboring Cherry Hill. Carol let out her breath and opened her eyes. She and her husband, Rabbi Fred Newlander, did not actually mind the commercial sprawl that had spread out around them since they had arrived in Cherry Hill 20 years ago. That was when Fred had gotten his first job as assistant rabbi at a Jewish synagogue in Cherry Hill named Emmanuel Temple. A rabbi is a spiritual leader and religious teacher of a Jewish community or congregation. In the two decades since their arrival, as Cherry Hill's population grew, so had the Jewish community that now made up almost a third of Cherry Hill's 70,000 residents. Many in that community were ethnic Jews, people who can trace their ancestry back to the land of Israel, and others were non-ethnic Jews who had converted to Judaism. And just a few years after taking that job as assistant rabbi at Emmanuel Temple, Fred had gone on to found his own synagogue named Makor Shalom, which is Hebrew for source of peace. Central to Judaism is the belief in one God who revealed himself through ancient prophets. 
But Fred's new synagogue also focused on adapting the 3,800-year-old religion to the social and cultural conditions of the modern world. And Fred's gamble had paid off big time. By 1994, Makor Shalom had grown from a few families meeting in members' houses into the largest Jewish temple in Cherry Hill, with a congregation of almost 4,000 members. And Fred and Carol had moved from their small apartment to a comfortable four-bedroom colonial house in one of the many subdivisions that had slowly but surely nibbled away at what had once been Cherry Hill's rolling farmland. But during those years, Fred was not the only one finding success. The last two decades had also been very good to Carol. She and Fred had had one daughter and two sons, and all three children were now either working or going to college or medical school. And 10 years ago, as Fred was busy building his congregation, Carol had decided to pursue her own dream. Working right out of her kitchen in their home at 204 Highgate Lane, Carol had poured her boundless energy into starting a business baking kosher cakes and selling them to local restaurants. With such a large Jewish community in Cherry Hill, Carol had recognized that there was an unmet demand among that group of customers for cakes and sweets that met strict Jewish dietary guidelines. And it would turn out the Gentile, non-Jewish residents of Cherry Hill were just as enthusiastic about Carol's cakes and cookies as the Jewish population was. So before long, what had started out as first Carol, then a handful of close friends making cakes in their ovens at home, had grown into Classic Cakes Company, with two large retail stores, one in nearby Audubon, and the other right there where Carol was standing, at the Eagle Plaza Shopping Center in Voorhees. Now, Classic Cakes employed close to 50 people, and combined sales from both bakeries easily topped $10,000 a day. And now, Carol thought to herself as she shouldered her purse and turned toward her own car out there in the parking lot, it was time to get on to the second half of her workday. It was Tuesday, October 25th, and on every Tuesday in the late afternoon, Carol and the other managers of Classic Cakes got together for their weekly business meeting in Cherry Hill at the home of the company's director of human resources. It was a meeting that often lasted as long as three hours. But as Carol walked over to her dark Toyota Camry out in the strip mall parking lot, opening the car door and slipping into the driver's seat, that sense of peace she had felt when she had looked up at the sky a few minutes earlier had left her. In its place was a sense of uneasiness. It had to do with her husband, Fred, and the six-month sabbatical that he had taken at the beginning of this year. A sabbatical is an extended paid leave period that gives an employee a chance to travel and study. And in Fred's case, the other staff at his synagogue had basically encouraged him to take this sabbatical, almost like it was a reward for all the hard work managing such a big congregation. And Fred had been excited about this sabbatical, but instead of using it to travel or study like most people do, Fred just used the time to grow out his thinning gray hair into a long ponytail, and then just kind of hung around the house in Cherry Hill and at his synagogue, Makor Shalom. Over the last 10 months, her husband had also become increasingly critical of his assistant rabbi, and to Carol, even after his sabbatical period had ended, Fred had seemed very distracted and preoccupied. Now, as Carol drove her car out of the Eagle Plaza parking lot and headed towards Route 70, she tried to reassure herself that Fred's change in behavior couldn't possibly have anything to do with their marriage. After all, they'd been together for almost 30 years, and during that time, Carol had come to know and cherish the qualities that made her and Fred such a strong couple. Where Fred was charismatic and bold, Carol was practical, warm, and good at listening to people. While Fred inspired people, Carol had a knack for making them feel like she was a trusted member of their family. And even though they had come from such different backgrounds, Carol and Fred had formed a loving and productive partnership. Carol, who had been born to wealthy parents, had grown up on the ocean side of New York in a big house with grounds that rolled down to the shore of Hewlett Bay. Fred, who was one year older than Carol, was the only child of immigrants who had grown up in the blue-collar section of Queens, New York, where his father had run a struggling dry-cleaning business and his mother had stayed home to take care of Fred. Carol and Fred had met on a blind date when they were both in college. Fred was studying religion at Trinity University in Connecticut, 
and Carol was studying psychology at an exclusive women's college in Massachusetts. Carol, who was small and elegant with auburn-colored hair, intelligent dark eyes, and great taste in clothes and jewelry, was instantly attracted to Fred, whose physical strength and rugged good looks made him seem much taller than his 5 feet 4 inch tall frame. The attraction was 100% mutual. The two of them got married in 1965, moved to Queens where Fred was later ordained as a rabbi, and by 1971, Cherry Hill, New Jersey would become the Newlanders' permanent home. And while Carol knew that the passage of the years and the daily routines of everyday life were bound to take the edge off the passion and romance that had brought her and Fred together three decades earlier, but she still felt that same attraction to Fred, and she knew that he felt the same way about her. Besides, in less than a week, they'd have some much-needed time to spend together when they headed up to New York this Saturday, October 29th, to visit some relatives. With this comforting thought in mind, Carol dragged her thoughts back to the work ahead of her. And by 4 p.m., after stopping on her way to run a couple of errands, Carol pulled into the driveway of the house where she would meet with her management team. A few hours later, Carol was once again back in her Toyota Camry, but even now her workday was not quite finished, because it had become Carol's habit that several days a week, she would take home that day's cash from both of her bakery branches, and then she would count the money right at her dining room table. Then, the next morning, she could just deposit the cash at the bank first thing. And while Carol thought this was an efficient and convenient way of doing things, Fred thought it was totally reckless, and he hated that she brought all that money home. Even though Carol kept telling Fred that no one outside of her management circle knew that she sometimes traveled with anywhere from five to $15,000 in cash tucked into her burgundy wallet at the bottom of her handbag, Fred told her that all of her bakery employees must see her walk out of the store with all that cash, and so he thought Carol was just asking to get robbed. But Carol had always waved off his concerns, saying that her employees were highly vetted and would never do that to her. And where they lived, Cherry Hill, was known as a very safe and quiet neighborhood. And so Carol told Fred that, you know, no one's ever going to break in and try to steal from them. After getting the cash from both of her bakery locations and hopping back into her car to make the ride back home, Carol glanced at her watch and saw that she still had time to call her 24-year-old daughter, Rebecca. Rebecca was married and a hospital administrator in Philadelphia. Carol had always been very close with Rebecca, and so she cherished these daily phone calls with her. So as Carol drove along, she picked up her car phone, she dialed Rebecca's number, and a few minutes later, she and her daughter were chatting happily about the day's events. Carol was still on the phone when she pulled into her driveway at 204 Highgate Lane. But before she could wrap up the call with Rebecca, Carol was suddenly startled by a loud knock on her car window right next to her head. After nearly dropping her phone, Carol turned and looked outside and saw this huge man standing there right in her driveway. Seeing the look of alarm on Carol's face, the stranger stepped back and put his hands up in the air reassuringly. Carol told Rebecca, who was now asking what's going on, what's going on, to just hang on for a minute that someone was here, and then Carol rolled her window down just a few inches and asked what this guy wanted. And the man in the driveway apologized for startling Carol, and then told her he was just there to see the rabbi and to deliver a package to him. Instantly, Carol could feel herself relax. She had been a rabbi's wife long enough that she'd come to expect visits from members of his congregation for all kinds of reasons and at all kinds of hours, day and night. Rolling the car window down the rest of the way, Carol smiled at the visitor and gestured toward the darkened house. She told him that the rabbi was not home yet, but the man was welcome to come inside and wait, and deliver the package in person. After hearing bits of this conversation her mother had just had with this unexpected visitor, Rebecca felt concerned, and when her mom put the phone back to her ear, Rebecca asked her to please give a call once this guy has left, so Rebecca would know that her mom was okay. Carol agreed, and then ended the call with Rebecca, and then Carol got out of her car, she shut the door behind her, and began walking toward her house, with the visitor walking right behind her. Carol had left her handbag filled with all the money in her car trunk. She would come out later when her visitor had left to bring it inside. But for now, Carol led the way to the front door, and when she got there, she unlocked it and gestured for her visitor to step into the small, warm entrance. But once the visitor was inside, the man began acting strange, glancing quickly left and right at the living room and dining rooms on either side of him and Carol, 
Then he began shifting his weight from one foot to another, and then suddenly, kind of awkwardly, he blurted out to Carol, Uh, can I just use your bathroom for a minute? Sensing what she took to be his embarrassment at having to make this request, Carol just smiled and said, of course, and directed him through the kitchen to the first floor bathroom at the back of the house. And then Carol walked back to the front of the house. When the man returned a few minutes later, Carol was standing near the front door looking through the mail that had been delivered that day, and she told the visitor that he was welcome to take a seat in the living room. But the big man just thanked her, said he was sorry for bothering her, and just handed Carol a plain white envelope and asked if she could give it to the rabbi. And then the visitor reached his hand out to open the front door. Meanwhile, almost without thinking, Carol, who had been going through the mail, when she was handed this envelope, she just opened it right away. And when she saw its contents, which was nothing, it was an empty envelope, she put her hand out and stopped this guy and said, hey, wait a minute, it's empty, did you give me the right one? The man looked startled and then told Carol he must have made a mistake and he picked up the wrong envelope earlier to bring by and so he'd just have to come by another time. And then without waiting to hear what Carol had to say, this man very quickly left the house and disappeared into the darkness. Back inside the house, Carol just tore up the empty envelope and dropped it into the wastebasket. Then she picked up the cordless landline phone and dialed Rebecca to tell her daughter that she didn't need to worry that the man was gone. And as Carol told her daughter about this guy, she laughed and smiled to herself as she described how he came in and just used the bathroom, gave her an empty envelope, and then ran away. It was just another day in the life of a rabbi's wife. An odd but funny story that Carol would tell friends a couple of times in the following couple of days before forgetting all about it. But exactly one week later, both Carol and her daughter, Rebecca, would find themselves remembering that strange encounter all too well. Not long after 8 p.m. on the evening of Tuesday, November 1st, 1994, Carol was once again arriving at her home on Highgate Lane after having left the weekly Classic Cakes business meeting. The weekend trip she and Fred had just taken to New York had not gone at all the way Carol had hoped. And now, as she pulled her car into the driveway and looked at her darkened house, she told herself that the dissatisfaction that her husband had told her he felt in their marriage was just the result of a late midlife crisis. It had all come out during a big argument they had had on their way home from New York that past Sunday, and Carol was still feeling really hurt and angry. By Monday night, both Carol and Fred had calmed down and agreed that they would go to both separate and joint marriage counseling sessions. They had also talked to each other about cutting back on some of the activities that over the years had drawn them into almost separate lives, Fred's religious duties and Carol's business. But Carol was still upset and shaken, and as she parked her car, turned off the engine, grabbed her purse, and then walked through a swirl of fallen leaves to the house, all she wanted was to get inside and call her daughter Rebecca. Carol knew that hearing her daughter's voice, maybe planning a shopping trip together next weekend, would put Carol in a happier frame of mind. And sure enough, a few minutes later, when Carol heard her daughter pick up the phone and say hello, Carol's spirits lifted. With a sigh of relief, Carol kicked off her shoes in the front hall and then settled in for a nice long chat. But only partway through their call, at around 8.30 p.m., Carol was interrupted by a knock on the front door. Carrying the cordless phone with her, Carol walked to the entryway and peered out the big oval stained glass window in the center of the door. Even through the colored glass, Carol recognized her visitor right away. It was the same huge guy who had stopped by last Tuesday with the empty envelope. Carol swung the door open, and even before the man had time to say, hey, it's me again, Carol had invited him inside. She assumed that he was there to see the rabbi again, or maybe this time deliver an envelope that actually had something inside of it. As the man stepped inside, Carol very quietly whispered into the phone to her daughter that her visitor was the bathroom man again. Then Carol turned her visitor and said she'd be off the phone in a minute, and for now he should just make himself comfortable in the living room. A minute later, Carol wrapped up her call with her daughter, and she put the cordless phone down on a wooden bench in the entryway. And then when she turned around, she was surprised to see her visitor, the bathroom man, had still not moved to the living room. He was still just standing right in front of the front door. Carol let out a quiet sigh, thinking to herself this man was still just as awkward now as he had been the last time they had met. But Carol's years of practice as a hostess kicked in, and she made herself smile. And stepping in front of her visitor, Carol invited the man to follow her deeper into the house. 
But Carol had only taken one or two steps away from him when she suddenly felt a big hand grab her left shoulder. And then before Carol could turn around or even understand what was happening, she felt an explosion of pain as something smashed into the back of her head. The blow was so hard it knocked Carol's glasses off of her face and sent her staggering into the middle of the living room. Then all at once she felt a powerful shove to the middle of her back and then she fell to her knees. A moment later, blood streaming down the sides of her face and into her ears, Carol collapsed onto the white carpet. Later, when the bathroom man looked inside of Carol's burgundy-colored wallet he had taken from her home, he couldn't believe his eyes. He'd been expecting to see thousands of dollars. Instead, he pulled out a grand total of $150. That day had been one of the rare days that Carol had decided not to bring home the cash from that day's sales at the two Classic Cakes locations. Meanwhile, at Temple Makor Shalom, located just a few minutes away from Highgate Lane, Rabbi Fred Newlander was finding it almost impossible to end the workday and get home. He'd had to check in on the weekly Alcoholics Anonymous meeting that was going on in one of the conference rooms, and he'd also sat in on choir rehearsal and one of the Jewish study classes taught by his assistant rabbi. He had checked in with Carol earlier that afternoon by phone before her business meeting. Since their argument on Sunday, their conversations had felt strained. Trying to ignore the frosty tone in his wife's voice, Fred had told her that he was probably going to be late that night, but at around 6 p.m. he did plan to go back to their house and have dinner with their son Matthew, but then he'd be leaving again and he wouldn't see her again until late. 20-year-old Matthew was a first-year medical student now at nearby Rutgers University, but he was still working part-time as an emergency medical technician with the Cherry Hill Fire Department. He lived at home with his parents, Carol and Fred, but between his classes and his 12-hour EMT shifts, his parents did not actually see much of him. Finally, just after 9 p.m. that night, Fred stepped out the door of McCor Shalom into the cool, cloudy November night. Like his wife Carol, Fred had also been thinking a lot about all the two of them had built and made together over the past nearly three decades. He knew his son Matt had overheard him and Carol arguing after they got home from their weekend trip to New York, and he also knew that Matt had wanted to talk to him over their dinner earlier that evening about what was going on with his parents. But his marriage was just not something Fred wanted to discuss with his children, and so he had pointedly turned the conversation in another direction every time Matt tried to talk about it. Now, 15 minutes after leaving the temple, Fred pulled his car into the driveway of 204 Highgate Lane. The lights were on in the house, and Carol's car was in its usual place. A minute later, at 9.20 p.m., Fred was at the front door of his house, and when he tried the handle, expecting it to be locked, he found it was unlocked. Fred shook his head at the lack of security, thinking about all that money Carol might be counting right now at the dining room table. Once the door was open, Fred expected to hear his wife immediately call out to see if that was him, but instead, the house seemed unusually still and quiet. And then, as Fred stepped inside the house, he saw Carol's feet just visible in the entrance to their living room. No shoes, just socks. A few more steps forward, and what Fred saw on the floor and walls and ceiling of the living room was so shocking that for a moment he was sure he was going to pass out. Struggling to make sense of the scene in front of him, Fred slowly started backing up and reaching out blindly behind him for the cordless phone that Carol had left in the entryway just an hour earlier. Two minutes later, at 9.22 p.m., the dispatcher at the Cherry Hill Police Department picked up an incoming 911 call. The man's voice at the other end of the line sounded like it was being dragged out of him. My wife is on the floor and there's blood all over. But a minute later, that same man's voice had sharpened into something closer to a scream. Standing in his front hallway talking to 911, Fred realized that his son Matthew was probably hearing this 911 call right now and that Matt, being an EMT, might be among the medical personnel that were now being rushed to the Newlander family home. The last of his composure crumbled, and Fred began begging the 911 operator not to let his son anywhere near his house. He could not let his son see his mother the way she was. Seven minutes later, Highgate Lane was crowded with police cars and emergency vehicles. Matt had not been allowed inside of the house, and he and Fred were standing together at the end of the driveway when an EMT came over and told them that, unfortunately, Carol was deceased. And no, it did not look like suicide. It looked like murder.
By 10 p.m., crime scene techs and homicide detectives had also started arriving at the scene. Officers put up yellow crime tape to hold back the gathering crowd of friends and neighbors that had begun to gather in the street outside of the Newlander's house. Friends also drove to Rebecca's apartment in Philadelphia to bring her back to Cherry Hill to join her father and her brother Matt. Later that same night, Fred's assistant rabbi would call another rabbi near the University of Michigan, where Carol and Fred's other son Benjamin was a freshman, so Benjamin would not be alone when the call came through that his mother was dead. Meanwhile, the investigation into Carol's death was already moving quickly. By 11 p.m. that night, Camden County detectives John Long and Arthur Folks had already zeroed in on their first potential suspect, Fred. After all, he was both the husband of the victim and the person who found Carol's body. And detectives' initial impression of the crime scene had weighed against the idea that the murder had been committed by a stranger in the course of a robbery. There had been no forced entry, no sign that the house had been ransacked, and Carol was still wearing valuable gold and diamond jewelry when her body had been discovered. The detectives were also suspicious of how calm Fred was when they first saw him. And the fact that there was not a single drop or smear of blood on his clothing told them that after finding his wife laying there, Fred had not made any attempt to check for a pulse or try to offer his wife any kind of aid because if he had, he would have had blood all over him. And although the detectives would have to wait until the forensics reports came back from the crime lab, the techs working the crime scene were not finding any fingerprints, no footprints or even impressions, and no sign of a murder weapon, which made investigators think that this attack had to have been carefully planned. And so detectives instantly became very interested in learning more about the Newlander's marriage. But before even having their first informal interview with Fred, the detectives assigned police officers to start interviewing neighbors to see if anyone had information about when Carol arrived home that evening and whether neighbors had seen any recent unusual or suspicious activity. Detectives also wanted to know if there were any security cameras on nearby homes that might have captured footage of someone entering or leaving the Newlander house. With all that done, the two detectives left the house just after 11 p.m. and joined Fred and his two older children inside the heated interior of one of the ambulances still parked outside the house. And right away, after speaking with them, the detectives learned about a new number one suspect. Because Rebecca had wasted no time telling the detectives about the two visits her mother had had from the so-called bathroom man, the stranger who had gone into the Newlander home with Carol exactly one week ago with the empty envelope, and the second visit had been that night. And now it seemed clear that tonight's visit from the bathroom man must have happened just before Carol was killed. And when Fred told police that Carol often brought home large amounts of cash from the bakeries, detectives realized that if all that turned out to be true, Carol may have been the target of a robbery after all. This possibility was strengthened when Fred and his children were able to confirm that there was something missing from the Newlander house, the burgundy-colored wallet where Carol hid her envelope full of cash. By 1.30 a.m. in the early hours of Wednesday, November 2nd, so just hours after Carol has been found, detectives had relocated to the Cherry Hill Police Station and were ready to conduct individual formal interviews, starting with Fred and his children. Rebecca repeated her information about the bathroom man, as well as telling police every detail she could remember from her recent phone calls with her mother. As for her parents' marriage, she said she was not aware of any serious problems or issues, but then again, she said she had not been living with them for some time. But in the interview with Rebecca's brother, Matt, which began at 2.30 a.m., he reluctantly admitted that his parents might have been going through some issues in their marriage. He told them about how his parents had gotten into that big fight during their car ride home from New York three days earlier, and that after they had returned, his mother had told him that his dad wanted out of the marriage. But by Monday, Matt said that things seemed to have calmed down, and yesterday afternoon, so Tuesday, the day Carol was killed, she'd even called Matt and told him not to worry, that his parents had done a lot of talking together and everything was going to be fine. It was 3.30 a.m. when Fred finally was asked to come into the interrogation room. When he answered the detective's questions, his voice sounded tired. By the end of the interview, it was obvious that he was finding it difficult to focus. 
He told investigators that the day before, he and Matthew had left the house together after their dinner around 6 p.m., and that Fred had gone straight to the temple, where he stayed until just a few minutes after 9 p.m. And then he drove back home, and he discovered his wife. When asked, Fred told detectives that he didn't think Carol was having any issues with any of her co-workers at Classic Cakes. He also told detectives that he couldn't think of really anyone in her life that would want to hurt her. And as for this bathroom man and the letter or package he wanted to give to Rabbi Fred, Fred just shook his head. Unexpected and sometimes bizarre visits came with the territory of ministering to the religious and spiritual needs of 920 different families. But Fred said he was not aware of or expecting any deliveries back on October 25th, so the bathroom man's first visit to Carol, or last night when the bathroom man had made his second appearance. He told detectives that Carol had mentioned the first encounter with the bathroom man to him, but she had seemed more amused by the whole thing than alarmed by it. And she had apparently not given anyone, including Fred or Rebecca or Matt, a real description of what the bathroom man had looked like, aside from saying he was big and dressed in a windbreaker. As for Fred's relationship with Carol, he said it was good, very good, that they both had been very faithful to each other and that they loved each other and never had to go get counseling or anything like that, and at no point had their relationship ever come close to being physically abusive. As Fred said all this, the detectives were acutely aware of the fact that Fred did not mention the fight he had apparently gotten into with Carol a few days earlier, according to his son Matt. When Fred was asked about the lack of blood on his clothes and why he hadn't at least reached down and checked for a pulse when he saw his wife on the floor, Fred bowed his head and then told them that it was immediately obvious to him that she was dead. A few hours after Fred's interview, on that same morning, Wednesday, November 2nd, police were back at the Newlander house to do a thorough inspection of the outside of the property. Crime techs had finished their work earlier in the morning and sent all the evidence they had collected from inside the house to the crime lab for analysis, and Carol's body had been transported to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. Neighbors woke up that Wednesday morning to the site of investigators using a ladder truck they'd borrowed from the local fire department to check the roof of the Newlander's house for any clues. Police officers had also fanned out to interview Carol's business partners and staff at Classic Cakes and Fred's assistant rabbi from Temple Makor Shalom. Other officers were tracking down any leads or information about deliveries to the Newlander property that may have been scheduled for around the time Carol was killed. But despite the promising lead about the bathroom man and the momentum of the first 48 hours, the investigation into Carol's murder almost immediately slowed to a discouraging crawl. No one had come up with any information that would help police find this mysterious bathroom man. Investigators couldn't find any deliveries scheduled for the Newlander house on either October 25th or November 1st, the two days the bathroom man was there. And Fred's assistant rabbi just shook his head no when detectives asked him if he knew of any marital problems between Fred and Carol. On Thursday, two days after the murder, and the day Carol's body was released by the medical examiner's office back to her family, 2,000 people attended a funeral service for Carol that was held in the sanctuary of Temple Makor Shalom. And after the funeral service, Fred announced that Carol's shiva, the Jewish equivalent of a wake, would be held at the Newlander's house, in the same room where Carol was killed. Despite contractors having come in and thoroughly cleaned that room, Carol's friends and family still noticed faint bloodstains under the new coat of paint on the walls and ceiling. It wasn't until the Newlander's phone records came back a few weeks after Carol's death that police finally got a break in the case. While looking for calls that had been made to or by Carol, police noticed one number that showed up over and over again. But it had nothing to do with Carol, and everything to do with her husband and a very high-profile member of his congregation. And by early December, police uncovered a scandal that would rock Cherry Hill and focus national media attention on one of the state's most charismatic religious leaders. Police would also find another possible suspect in the murder of Carol Newlander. It would turn out Fred had lied to police when he described his marriage as being really solid, and he'd told an even bigger lie when he described himself as being a faithful husband. 
Instead, starting on December 24th, 1992, so two years before Carol was killed, Fred had begun having an affair with a 48-year-old local celebrity and member of his congregation, Elaine Sonsini. And so that phone number that had shown up in the Newlanders call records was Elaine Sonsini's number. Elaine was a well-known on-air radio personality who hosted a popular morning news program out of a big station in Philadelphia. She had met Fred when he had officiated her late husband's funeral. Before, and especially during, the rabbi's six-month sabbatical, he and Elaine had been meeting up almost every day to have sex, even deadbolting the door of Fred's private office and using Temple Makor for their illicit get-togethers. As police started to press Elaine for details about her involvement with Fred and whether she had any direct or indirect involvement with the murder of his wife, Elaine, who had a solid alibi, decided it was time to lawyer up and go public with her side of the story and the details of the affair. And suddenly, Fred was back at the top of the suspect list, both in terms of the police investigation and the news accounts that were now appearing in major regional and local media. For Fred, when this affair went public, it was devastating. There are lots of married couples who have experienced infidelity, but in Fred's case, his affair and infatuation with Elaine had automatically stamped him not only as one of America's many unfaithful husbands, but also as a murderer. Even his alibi was now being treated by investigators and definitely by the media as too good, too convenient that maybe the rabbi had just arranged for his wife's death so he could ride off into the sunset with the beautiful Elaine Sonsini. But despite Fred continuing to shout from the rooftops that he hadn't done anything and that the police still had not found a single shred of evidence connecting him to his wife's murder, Fred knew it didn't really matter because the media, and to some degree the police, had already decided he was guilty. And so, desperate to clear his name, Fred went on the offensive. Not only did he hire a defense attorney to represent him, he also revealed to the public that within days of Carol's death, he had already hired his own private investigator to try to find out who killed his wife and why. 49-year-old Len Jenoff had been both a member of Temple McCor and an acquaintance of Fred's since 1992. But it was Len's background in security and covert operations with the U.S. and Israeli Secret Services, along with his private investigator's license, that had caught Fred's attention. Len also had close ties with the local police. And even though Len had not really made any more progress in finding Carol's killer than Camden County law enforcement, once Fred went public with Len's involvement in the case in early 1995, Len became a sort of unofficial spokesperson for the embattled rabbi. But for Fred, despite his best efforts, his life seemed to just continue to go from bad to worse. On February 26th, 1995, the damage to his reputation had become so bad that he resigned his post as head rabbi of the synagogue he had founded 20 years earlier. Several months later, on June 9th, 1995, Fred's lover, Elaine Sonsini, left Fred and married one of the police officers who had been assigned to help with the investigation into Carol Newlander's death. A year after that, in April of 1996, the Central Conference of American Rabbis suspended Fred from practicing as a rabbi for a minimum of two years as punishment for his extramarital affair. But despite Fred's life crumbling all around him, his private investigator continued to have his back telling everyone that while Fred certainly was guilty of adultery, that didn't mean he was also guilty of murder. Fred deeply appreciated Len's support, but what he really needed from his private eye, or from anyone at this point, was evidence about who actually killed his wife. But it wasn't until late April 2000, almost six and a half years after Carol Newlander was brutally murdered, that police finally would find that evidence. That month, investigators answered a phone call from someone who said they had important information that would help authorities identify Carol's killer. The conversation that came next would turn everything the police thought they knew about this case upside down. Based on what this caller was able to tell law enforcement, here is a reconstruction of what really happened to Carol on the evening of November 1st, 1994. In the deep end, it's so neat and it's pulling me. Geronimo, oh oh, 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 Geronimo, oh oh,
The bathroom man was sure he had planned Carol's murder down to the last detail. But when Carol had let him into her house on the night of Tuesday, October 25th, he knew right away that he had made a mistake. As soon as he stepped inside, he had seen immediately that Carol's purse, and more importantly, the burgundy-colored wallet, were nowhere in sight. And so the bathroom man, he struggled for a moment trying to keep his composure before changing his plan. He had to be sure the purse and the wallet were here. So, thinking quickly, he asked Carol if he could use her bathroom. But instead of actually going to the bathroom, the man just walked around Carol's first floor, checking all of the rooms for this purse and wallet. But when he couldn't find them, he knew he'd just have to come back another time. And so he walked back to the front door where Carol was, and he handed her that envelope, telling her it was the package he had come to give to the rabbi, and then he was about to leave when Carol had opened it up. Now, the bathroom man knew the envelope was empty. Delivering it to the rabbi was just his excuse he was using to get inside of the house. And so when Carol immediately opened the envelope right in front of him and told him, hey, look, it's empty, the bathroom man suddenly panicked, wondering if Carol was onto him. But he could see in her face right away that she wasn't. She was just concerned he had not delivered the right letter, and so he should come by another time when he had the right letter. One week later, on November 1st, the bathroom man took steps not to repeat his earlier mistake. This time, he waited until Carol had walked inside of her house, carrying her purse over her shoulder, before he also walked up to the door and began knocking. Bathroom man felt a stab of alarm when the door opened and he saw that Carol was talking to someone on the telephone. But that was followed by relief when she invited him inside before he even had to say who he was or why he was there. Once inside, he glanced quickly into both front rooms, and this time he saw the purse sitting on the dining room table. Even as Carol finished her call and placed the cordless phone down on the bench near them in the entryway, bathroom man was already adjusting his windbreaker to make sure he could easily access the one-foot-long metal pipe he had stuck in his back pants pocket. Satisfied that the purse and wallet were definitely here, he focused again on Carol and heard her tell him to follow her through the living room into the sun parlor. But as soon as Carol had turned away from him and had begun taking a few steps across the hardwood floor onto the white carpet, bathroom man reached behind his back and pulled out the metal pipe and clutched it in his right hand. And then, with his left hand, he reached out and he grabbed Carol's left shoulder, forcing her to come to an abrupt stop, and then before she could turn around, bathroom man had lifted the pipe into the air and brought it crashing down into the back of Carol's head. A moment later, he used his left hand to shove Carol hard in the center of her back, sending her flying into the living room where her knees began to buckle out from under her. As she collapsed forward onto the ground, Carol uttered a single word. Why? Bathroom man didn't answer her. Instead, he turned back to the door and quickly motioned to his much younger accomplice who was waiting outside in the bushes to come inside and finish the job. Seconds later, bathroom man had handed off the length of pipe to his much younger companion, and as bathroom man headed for the dining room to get the burgundy wallet out of Carol's purse, his companion got to work on Carol. From the dining room, bathroom man could hear the sickening thuds of what would be at least 12 savage blows to Carol's head that would break her skull and inflict catastrophic injuries to her brain. An autopsy would later show that Carol had tried to protect herself by putting her hands up over the back of her head, but this younger accomplice of bathroom man had hit her hands so hard with the pipe that he'd practically amputated one of her fingers. When bathroom man stepped back into the living room to make sure Carol was dead, he had to stop and catch his breath. The beating the younger companion had administered on Carol had taken less than a minute, but in those 45 seconds, the upswings of the metal pipe had sprayed the walls and ceiling with so much blood that it looked like a scene out of a horror movie. And Carol lay on her side at the center of it all, 
Her neat blue pantsuit and print top slowly darkening in the pool of blood, spreading out around her and soaking into the thick pile of the white carpet. Bathroom man walked over and checked Carol for a pulse, and when he didn't find one, he and his younger companion left the house. Once outside, the two men got into a single car and drove to a nearby brightly lit parking lot outside of a department store. After his younger accomplice changed into clean clothes, bathroom man gathered up any bloodstained belongings and the bloodstained pipe, and he stuffed it all into a small duffel bag. Then he pulled out Carol's burgundy wallet. He thought of the thousands of dollars that he was sure to find inside of it as a bonus payment on top of what he had already been paid to commit this murder. But inside the wallet, all he found was $150. The two killers split the money, and then with a sudden gesture of disgust, Bathroom Man threw the burgundy wallet onto the floor of his car. A minute later, Bathroom Man's accomplice had climbed out of the passenger seat and settled in behind the wheel of his own car that he'd parked there earlier in the evening. He gave Bathroom Man a wave before pulling out of the parking lot and heading back to the apartment the two men shared. A few minutes later, Bathroom Man was also on the road, but he was not going back to the apartment. Instead, he headed east towards the nearest police station. He stopped only once along the way, to buy four cups of coffee. Later that night, he would make a drive out to Philadelphia and stop at different dumpsters along the way to dispose of the small duffel and bloody clothes, the murder weapon, and the empty burgundy wallet. But for right now, he had an alibi he needed to build. So at 9.12 p.m., Bathroom Man, a.k.a. Rabbi Fred Newlander's own private investigator, Len Genoff, did what he did on most Tuesday nights. He drove to the Evesham Township Police Station five miles from the Newlander house, and then he walked inside and made his way to the detective bureau, where he delivered the coffees he had bought to his good buddies on the night shift, and where he settled in to wait for the news to break that Rabbi Fred Newlander's wife was dead. It wouldn't be until two days after Carol's murder, on Thursday, November 3rd, at her funeral service in the sanctuary of Temple Makor Shalom, that Len would again see the person who had promised him $30,000 for killing the rabbi's wife. When it was Len's turn in line to console the stricken and grieving rabbi, Len stepped forward to shake Fred Newlander's hand, but before he could, Carol's husband pulled Len in for a big hug. And when the two men were cheek to cheek, Fred whispered his thanks in Len's ear for getting the job done. The murder had gone exactly as Rabbi Fred Newlander had planned it. It would turn out that back in the summer of 1994, not long after the end of Fred's six-month sabbatical, his mistress, Elaine Sonsini, had told Fred he had until the end of that year to end his marriage with Carol or Elaine would break off their affair. As the rabbi started to think about his choices, he decided he'd rather see Carol dead than risk the damage that a divorce might do to his reputation. So, in August, Fred approached Len Genoff, a member of his congregation who claimed to have worked with both the U.S. and Israeli secret services. Both those claims, and almost everything else Len had told people about his background, insecurity, and covert operations, turned out to be false. But when Len's rabbi and spiritual leader Fred Newlander asked him if he would be willing to put his skills to work and kill a so-called enemy of Israel, Len said yes. Only the enemy turned out to be the rabbi's wife, and her only sin was that she stood between the rabbi and his mistress. While Len knew who Carol was, Carol did not know who Len was. There were over 4,000 people in the congregation, and so Carol and Len had just never actually met. After Len agreed to do the job, Fred spent the next few months explaining to Len exactly how he wanted the murder to look, like a robbery gone wrong. Fred also gave Len a hand-drawn map showing the layout of the inside of the Newlander house and where Len should look for Carol's purse and wallet. The murder would have to take place on a Tuesday night when Carol and Fred's son, Matthew, was at work and when there were enough evening activities at the temple that Fred could construct an airtight alibi for himself. Then, immediately after the murder, the rabbi would hire Len to act as a private investigator working to clear the rabbi's good name. Len had done a lot of things in his life that he was not proud of, but cold-blooded murder was not one of them. So, for this job, Len had decided to hire an accomplice, his 21-year-old roommate, Paul Daniels. Like his older friend, 
Paul was a recovering alcoholic, but he was also broke and he suffered from a variety of mental disorders. When Len offered Paul $7,500 if Paul would actually be the one to kill Carol, Paul could not believe his good fortune. On October 20th, 1994, two weeks prior to Carol's murder, when Len had actually handed the $7,500 to his young accomplice, Paul had grabbed the money and then jumped up out of his chair, where he spent most of his days watching TV, and he began yelling in excitement, That bitch is dead! But starting immediately after Carol's murder, the guilt over what he had done started eating away at Len Jenoff. And by the beginning of 1996, so roughly a year and a half after Carol's murder, Len had become an off-the-record source, that's someone who is never identified by name, for a reporter who was covering the investigation into the Carol Newlander homicide. And by May of 2000, almost six years after Carol's death, that reporter, who had gradually learned the truth from Len, had convinced Len to go to police and tell them the truth about what happened to Carol. It would take two trials before a jury found Fred Newlander guilty of the murder of his wife, Carol. As a star witness, Len Jenoff was both a blessing and a curse. He could implicate the rabbi as the mastermind who set up the homicide, but Len's own history of telling one huge lie after another about his own life and background threw everything he had to say into question. And compared to the eloquent denials of Rabbi Fred, and the fact that there was no hard evidence linking the rabbi to the actual murder, Fred Newlander's first trial in 2001 ended in a hung jury. But by the time the case was retried less than one year later, Rabbi Fred had lost his most important supporters, his children, Matt and Rebecca, both of whom wound up testifying against him. In November of 2002, Rabbi Fred was found guilty of murder and conspiracy, and on January 15th, 2003, he was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. Both Len Jenoff and his accomplice Paul Daniels were convicted of aggravated manslaughter and sentenced to a maximum of 23 years. They were both released from prison in 2014 after serving their mandatory minimum of 10 years. <laughs> 